Welcome to all of you. I'll go ahead and start my introductory remarks. There will definitely be more that are just uh, getting out of class. As I said, my name is Rich Lyons. I'm the Dean of the Haas School of Business here at Berkeley. I welcome all of you. This is part of the Dean's Speaker Series. Most of you know that it is our highest profile speaker series that we have here. We've had many, many high-level speakers here. Mark Hurd was here recently, Jeff Immelt, uh, GE, and we have a lot of wonderful events that are coming up. Please keep your eye on that calendar. For example, even next week, Steve Ellis, the Worldwide Managing Director of Bain Consulting, will be here to speak. Bain is, of course, a partnership, so Worldwide Managing Director means uh, CEO in that world. And he will be here in the Wells Fargo room on Wednesday, Feb 3rd at 1230 also. Uh, make sure that you register in advance, like this event. Uh, we want to make sure we get people in that we can because we're at a capacity crowd here today and we will be next week as well. We're honored here today to uh, welcome Mr. John Anderson as the leader of Levi Strauss, the CEO of Le Levi Strauss and Company. Our Haas School, as you know, has a long and very, very close relationship with this organization and with the family that is behind it. Uh, in fact, the Haas family are descendants of Levi Strauss. Levi Strauss was the co-originator of the Blue Jean and founder of Levi Strauss and Company. The Haas, the Haas family remains today as owners of the privately held firm that is Levi Strauss. The family's commitment to the university, it began right from the earliest days. In fact, Levi Strauss himself uh, endowed 20 eight scholarships in 1897. Cal Berkeley was founded in 1868, as you know. So these were the earlier years of Berkeley's past. Walter A. Haas was the former Levi Strauss and Company president and chairman, 1910 graduate of our business school. He was a business school uh, business major here at Berkeley. And of course, our school is named after Walter A. Haas Sr. And that naming was 1989. We're very fortunate today to have this one, many, many dimensioned relationship with Levi Strauss. There's connectivity into our Center for Responsibility, into our YAY program, Young Entrepreneurs at Haas. This is reaching into disadvantaged high school youth in the region and building entrepreneurial skills. Uh, the Levi Strauss Small Grants Program, uh, many, many elements of the connectivity between Levi Strauss, uh, the Haas family more broadly, and Cal and the Haas School here. I'm especially also pleased to have a former CEO and current chairman of Levi Strauss and & Company, and that's Bob Haas. He's sitting seated here in front of me. Thanks, Bob, for being here with us today. Bob is a trustee of the Evelyn and Walter Haas Jr. Fund, also a Berkeley Fellow, and he is the grandson of Walter A. Haas and our school's namesake, as I mentioned. During Bob's time as CEO of Levi Strauss, he reinforced the legacy, the immense legacy, of corporate social responsibility and philanthropy at Levi Strauss. For over a century, that family has earned a stellar reputation throughout California and, of course, beyond California through its leadership in the areas of socially responsible business, philanthropy, community service, et cetera. Let me also say here at the Haas School, uh, we, we have a uh, leading responsibly is something we've always taken very, very seriously. Corporate responsibility, corporate social responsibility, long before it was fashionable, was a very, very important topic here and will com continue to be. And our topic today, and I will get to our speaker, is innovative sustainability strategies. And John Anderson is a perfect person to talk to us about that. At the beginning of his career three decades ago at Levi Strauss, as a product manager in Australia. Mr. Anderson has held a variety of positions in the company, including president of both the Asia Pacific region and also the global sourcing organization. In the 1990s, he was head of merchandising in the US. He helped pioneer the company's efforts to integrate more sustainable cotton and fabrics into its products, years before most companies began going into eco, so-called eco lines. More recently, John helped lead the extension of the company's social and environmental requirements to upstream suppliers through the whole chain upstream, including the fabric mills who supply the fabric to manufacturing facilities. As current CEO, he established the company's environmental vision, which he will talk about today, guides the company's efforts as one of the leading sustainable apparel brands in the world. Levi Strauss and Company is one of the world's largest brand name apparel marketers. You know that. Sales in more than 110 companies, many signature brands. Uh, Levi's Dockers and, and many, many others. Staff, company, roughly 10,000 worldwide, uh, over 1,000 in their San Francisco headquarters. It is with great, great pleasure that I turn it over to Mr. John Anderson. Thank you, John. Thank you. 
Well, um, good afternoon, everybody. Just before I start, a couple of things. Um, if I sound a little funny, bear with me. I just reminded, you don't sound like a normal American. Uh, so the accent is unique, but I have no doubt you will get to understand what I'm doing. The other thing I'd like to encourage all of you, how many people are wearing jeans today? That's not quite enough, <laughs> but directionally correct. Get out there and wear jeans, and if you can't wear jeans, Dockers pants will suffice. <laughs> so I do want to thank all of you, though, the opportunity to share with you the point of view on Levi Strauss and company sustainability. Um, i also like to thank you, uh, and the Dean, kind words, thank you, uh, but to recognise him to give us the opportunity to do this. I have a dilemma. Anyone who's ever worked for Levi Strauss and Co and wants to start talking about the responsibilities of the corporation would be well advised to take, uh, to approach the topic with a bit of modesty. At the very least, they should recognise that the topic is not exactly a new one for this company. The relationship between Levi Strauss and company, its products, its employees and its customers is, to use the unavoidable metaphor, woven deep in the fabric of the place. I realised that on the first day I arrived and as you heard that was quite some time ago. It is an entrenched part of our history. Everyone who works here quickly learns that the stories of how a 157 year old company earned profits through principles at every stage of its history. Some examples include how we kept employees on the payroll even after the earthquake of 1906 how we integrated our factories years before it was common practice, how we pioneered policies for employees with HIV AIDS, how we created the Red Tab Foundation to help retired employees in times of need. Even in today's tough economic times, we remain committed. Last week, in response to the devastating earthquake in Haiti, we provided grants to organisations supporting the rescue and relief efforts and our matching employees' contributions. In the context of that humbling history, I'd like to dive into the subject of responsibility of companies today. Now, I do so with some hesitation. Today might be one of the most difficult times in recent memory to talk about trust, responsibility and reputation in business. The financial crisis and the Wall Street excesses of the last few years have, if anything, eroded public trust in business. Even the motives of well-intentioned companies, I'm afraid, have been hurt in this mess. One of the other victims has been the very notion of corporate social responsibility, CSR. The idea that companies have a higher responsibility than maximising profit. I think the general cynicism about business that has emerged over the last year or so has encouraged critics. On the right, we hear more people echoing the arguments of the late economist Milton Friedman that a company should only be in the business of returning profit to the shareholder. And on the left, some like Berkeley professor Robert Reich argue that CSR has become a form of brand marketing. It's a rich debate and both sides have a legitimate point of view. Despite these arguments, there is some practical in the field evidence that companies that are committed to responsible citizenship really do make a difference for the health of their companies. Not long ago, McKinsey and Company, the consulting firm, surveyed a large group of chief financial officers about CSR. They found that a large majority of these CFOs believed that their company CSR initiatives really did create value and strengthen the organisation. The problem was they didn't know exactly how to measure that success. With this level of doubt and confusion about what a company can do to make a difference, I want to suggest it might be time for some fresh thinking about the responsibilities of a company. I want to focus my talk on the issue of sustainability, which is known to all of you here. To me, sustainability has become the touchstone of the entire discussion about the relationship between business and the society it serves. It is a global issue 
with an impact in every country and every community. It is the focus of legislation at every level, and certainly in the coming year, the United States Senate, as we look ahead to the debate of climate and energy legislation. It is becoming well documented as a source of cost efficiency and savings through reduction of energy consumption, excess materials and even more efficient business practices. Witness Walmart's success in this area and even as a source of business opportunity as GE's imagination efforts have demonstrated. And most important, sustainability has broad and deep global support. This is not a contentious issue. It is instead a mandate for creative thinking and imaginative partnerships. Now, as I alluded to earlier, the sustainability movement is hardly new. Companies have been talking about green policies for some time now. But today, perhaps more than ever, we in business need to establish a new level of leadership in sustainability. We need a more rigorous and systemic way of illustrating the problem and solving it. If sustainability and business slips into a few well-worn cliches and corporate slogans, then I think we are failing in our role as business leaders. In order to recapture public trust, we need to be as rigorous about sustainability as we are about our business, our financial reporting and our relationship with customers. At Levi Strauss and Company, thinking about sustainability was just a natural extension of the way we saw ourselves and our responsibility. By the latter part of the last century, we had become one of the world's most famous global brands. We had factories around the world, hundreds of stores. We shipped and trucked our clothes hundreds of thousands of miles. We made an impact on the environment that we were very much aware of. And we tried to do something about it. For more than two decades, Levi's has been a leader on environmental issues. Two decades ago, we established our global sourcing guidelines. That stated, amongst other things, that we would only do business with partners who share our commitment to the environment and conduct their business in line with our philosophy. Now, this was just not about words. In those days, we were producing over 300 million garments per year. When we put our sourcing guidelines into practice and we demanded that our contractors obey them, they said, sure, we'll do it, but we're going to charge you 20 cents a unit extra. 300 million garments, 20 cents a unit extra. And this organisation said, we will pay the cost. That, I think, is an example of really living up to the commitment. We paid the cost and we sent the benchmark for the apparel industry. Today that is no longer a cost. Today that's the way everybody operates. All leading apparel brands now have their sourcing guidelines. All leading apparel brands have leveraged their sourcing guidelines off the leadership position we took. That I think is a great example. Companies having the courage, companies having a commitment and companies willing to make a difference. It was a start and we kept pushing with a restricted substance list, global effluent guidelines and ambitious recycle and reuse programs. The long-term goal remains to be a zero-impact company. We want to build sustainability into everything we do so that our profitable growth helps restore the environment. We think about it all the time. It is part of our business ethos. Now, we won't alone on this front. There have been lots of great visionary companies that through determination and innovation were moving toward becoming a carbon neutral business. They deserve our applause and encouragement. But the more we looked at the world and looked at ourselves, the more we felt we needed to be even tougher on this issue. Like the CFOs who knew that corporate social responsibility was important but just couldn't measure it, we felt the same way towards sustainability. What really was? our impact on the environment. So we decided to take another step, a leap really. We wanted to build a rigorous and credible assessment of our own impact on sustainability, something that was science-based 
and led by an independent third party. We wanted to understand not just the programs we had started, but the real impact of our products in their entire life cycle, a cradle to grave study. Our instinct was that if we understood the full scope of our impact, we could create a sustainability program that was far more comprehensive and meaningful. And we also felt that understanding our true impact would give us the clarity to articulate our vision and set priorities for our environmental work around the world. We didn't just want praise for what we'd done in the past. We wanted an action plan for the future. So we got started. So allow me to take a few minutes to tell you about what became known as our life cycle assessment. So this chart here, we start with cotton on your left. That's the base of our, all our products. The cotton is then taken to the mills and it's spun into thread. The next step is we go to the textile manufacturers and the thread is woven into denim or into a khaki twill which goes into our dockers' pants. After that, we ship the fabric around the world to wherever these garments are manufactured. Then the product is used. After that, possibly into recycling. And if it does go into recycling, the cycle starts again. Hopefully, that's where it will end up and more and more of our attention has been focused on how we can keep recycling the product and extend the life cycle of these products or it ends up in landfill. So that is what we call our cycle to grave evaluation. And this is one of the few categories where literally the product can end up in the grave. We started with the basics. One pair of Levi's 501 jeans and one pair of Docker's original car keys. And we asked an independent team to tell us everything, absolutely everything, that went into the full life cycle of these two core products. Every input, every cost, every impact, from the cotton in the ground to the last time the pants are washed or taken to a landfill. To conduct the study, we worked with expert scientists from PE Americas, a Boston-based firm, to track our energy, water, climate, and every other impact they could find whether it was cutting fabric or shipping the pants to a mall. We wanted to develop some hard and fast measurements. We wanted to know the full impact, not just a snapshot that would make us look good. The whole study took almost a year and the results were more detailed with greater implications than we could have imagined. Our study found that a single pair of 501s from growing the cotton to consumer care and disposal really does have an impact, a significant impact. The life cycle study of one pair of 501 generates 32.3 kilograms of carbon. That is the equivalent of 78 miles driven by the average car in the United States. It's the same amount of carbon sequestered by six trees a year. The 501s use 3,480 litres of water, the same as taking 53 showers or running a garden hose for 106 minutes or flushing a toilet 575 times. Then there is energy use, 400 megajoules of energy, as much as it takes to power a plasma screen TV for 318 hours. I think if we'd stopped analysing the data right there, it would have been instructive, but it also would have been incomplete. The truth is, and this isn't boasting, the policy is already in place at Levi, Strauss and Co for reducing energy, water and chemicals in our manufacturing process have come a long way. We have made real strides and are proud to be leaders in the apparel industry. But the real lesson of the life cycle study is that some of the biggest sustainability impacts have nothing to do with processing denim, sewing jeans or shipping clothes. What we learned, to our surprise, with some of the biggest environmental impacts we make fall outside our supply chain control, namely 
growing cotton and consumers washing and drying our clothes. Now, this really was a reservation for us. Looking at water use for a pair of 501s. 49% of the water is used to grow the cotton and 45% is used when our customers wash their jeans. That meant only 6% of the water is used in the rest of the manufacturing process. There's a similar picture when you look at climate change impact and energy consumption. 58% of the climate impact of a pair of 501s occurs in the consumer use phase. Energy used in washing and drying. So only 42% occurs before the consumer takes their jeans home. I guess there are two ways to react to this news. One is to say, phew, we only play a small part in that. We've got no responsibility to the rest. We'll focus on what we control. It's someone else's problem. But as you might guess, Levi Strauss and Company has never really taken a narrow view of our business or our responsibilities. So that led us to the only other reasonable reaction. We realised that if we're going to talk about sustainability and talk about it seriously, we need it to stretch well beyond our immediate business. We need to think about how we might harness the power of our brands to address issues as big as cotton and the washing machine. Integrity is a deeply felt corporate value for us and for the products we make. Simply outsourcing the manufacturing process does not absolve us from responsibility for the overall impact of our products. So what do we do? Changing the way cotton is grown and what people do with our products once they leave the store isn't something we have a direct impact on. We had to figure out how we could influence a fragmented global agricultural business on the one end of the pipeline and change the behaviour of millions of Levi's customers at the other end. Let me dive into this a bit just so you understand the scope of the problem. Cotton is our core raw material. Over 95% of all our products use cotton. Cotton is the world's largest non-food crop. It is grown in more than 100 countries, with China, India and the US being the top producers. In 2008, the cotton textile market was valued at more than $40 billion. In terms of impact, more than 40 million farmers and 290 million farm workers depend on cotton for their livelihood. 80% of cotton farms are quite small and many are family owned. Cotton uses a lot of pesticides and drinks a lot of water. Cotton is a massive industry and when you think about its impact on people and the environment, it dwarfs the manufacturing stage of our product life cycle. Our challenge is that because cotton is a commodity, it's extremely difficult to trace where the cotton and any given product comes from. We get our cotton fabric from close to 150 textile mills. Based on mill locations, we can roughly determine that the majority of our cotton comes from the US, China, India, Pakistan and Turkey. But there is no credible, reliable system to trace the origin of global cotton supply. However, we are piloting a traceability program this year and we hope this will further better inform our role in the process. As you can see, cotton is a complex business and influencing the way it is grown is no easy task. Even though Levi's is a large cotton consumer, the reality is that we use less than 1% of the world's annual cotton crop. So we have to ask, how can we impact cotton growing practices at the farm level? Our response is to try to work at three levels. Build a sustainable cotton supply chain, create alliances with all businesses that use cotton and work with farmers to help improve their growing methods. 
To that end, we've joined forces with other brands and retailers such as Marks and Spencers, Adidas and Ikea, and an organisation called the Better Cotton Initiative. You know about organic cotton, which addresses the use of chemicals in cotton agriculture. Better cotton reduces chemical use and goes beyond that to try and address other environmental impacts such as water use and soil health. It also includes labour standards and tries to improve financial profitability for farmers. So it incorporates the three key aspects of sustainability, environmental, social and economic sustainability. Our goal of working with other brands on the Better Cotton Initiative is to mobilise greater buying power to make cotton agricultural more sustainable throughout the world. We've had three years of experience and initial results are encouraging. We've seen one third reduction in pesticide and water use and net profit increases for farmers up to 68% in the pilot sites. Another example of how we're trying to influence change concerns cotton grown in Uzbekistan. Over the past two years we've learned with, we've teamed up with other companies, socially responsible investors and NGOs to take a stand on how cotton is grown in that country where forced child labour is a big concern. Now we don't buy cotton directly but we've asked our suppliers not to buy Uzbek cotton. Through this coalition we're sending a powerful message to the Uzbek government to end the practice of taking children from school and forcing them to work in fields picking cotton. We see this as part and parcel of sustainability issues. More important for us at Levi Strauss and Co, it is a part of our legacy. In the late 1800s, we published advertising posters for our jeans that read, patented, riveted clothing, the best in use for farmers, mechanics and miners. Since then our customer base has broadened. But I think a company that started focusing on the needs of farmers ought to have a responsibility to continue to work with them, improving their work and product 150 years later. We're proud to do this. As I mentioned, growing cotton is one end of the problem. How consumers use our products is the other. Through our life cycle assessment, we've learned about washing and drying clothes. We've learned a lot. Some of it's pretty basic. Washing in cold water instead of warm. Switching from a top-loaded to a front-loaded washing machine. And line drying. All can make a big difference to climate impact. And if we could encourage customers to wash their jeans less frequently, that would reduce the climate, energy and water impact all at once. For example, if you washed your jeans once every two weeks, instead of once a week, over two years, you could cut the climate impact from 32 to 21 kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalent, a reduction of 30%. Water consumption, 30, sorry, 30% water, water consumption would drop more than 25%. And by the way, you also save money. So here's a challenge to you in the audience. I'm sure your parents probably say to you, do you wash your sheets? Do you wash your jeans? Do you wash your clothes? Tell them you don't and you're doing it for a reason. It's all about sustainability. I can tell you the story myself. I now make sure I wear jeans at least three or four times before I wash them. It's a small gesture, but if we all do it, you know, the facts show what a difference that can make. So when you're with your parents, tell them back off. You're doing all the right things and you're leaving the environment in a better place. Small steps, but a big impact. In truth, this part of the life cycle might be easier for us. We've always been a consumer-facing company. As anyone has been to our archives in San Francisco and seen the thousands of letters we've received can tell you, we are in constant conversation with millions of our customers about style, fit and quality. Now we have to broaden that conversation. Everything I've learned about our customers tells me that this is a topic they really do want to be engaged in. They want to know more about the environmental impact of their fashion choices. 
They want to be responsible at how they care for their clothes. They think it is the right thing for us to stimulate a dialogue with them about what happens to our products after they've been purchased. So we're starting with small steps. We've partnered with the Alliance to Save Energy and Procter & Gamble to encourage consumers to save energy and money by washing their jeans in cold water. We recently launched an exciting new partnership with Goodwill, a care tag for our planet. You can see it here. To spread the word with consumers that caring for their clothes can help care for the planet. By changing our care tags, we were the first major apparel company to change our garment care labels to urge consumers to take action by washing in cold water, line drying and donating unwanted clothing. We're hoping this helps put a dent in the 68 billion pounds of clothing a year that ends up in the landfills. In fact, we're launching this in our retail stores today with care tag education in the windows of all of our retail stores in the United States and promotions with local goodwill locations across the country. And we're working, we're working to make this a global program. The role here for creativity, imagination and outreach is huge. But it is one that we're very comfortable with. Anyone who remembers sitting in a bathtub with their first pair of rigid 501 jeans so that they would shrink to fit, understands that we've always had a bond with our customer that goes beyond manufacturing. I guess it's the reality that your parents probably remember more of doing that, but you can still do it today. We spend a lot of time thinking about how customers wear our clothes. Now we have to spend just as much time thinking about how our customers care for them. What have we learned in all of this? To begin with, in the apparel industry, you realise what a paradoxical life you must lead. On the one hand, you have to pay attention to changing tastes and fashion. On the other hand, you have to keep your eye on enduring values if you're going to be true to yourself. That's the test that sustainability puts to all of us. It's what makes the challenge so interesting. And it is a challenge. I won't pretend for a second that even if we get everything right, we will have solved all the environmental issues before us. We're deeply active in reducing our overall carbon footprint, building sustainable retail stores and making our manufacturing even more efficient. But sustainability, as I've tried to describe today, sets out a broader, harder role for us. Our first goal, of course, is to reduce the long-term environmental impact of our products and influence our partners and customers along the way to help us. But I also have to admit to a second goal. This process for us was a new way of thinking about how a company that values both profits and principles can engage in society in a new way. I'm hoping what we've started becomes a template for other businesses. I'm hoping what we have done will be used inside and outside the clothing industry, as well as young business leaders like you. My advice is pretty simple. First, establish common measurements. Measure the right things and do it rigorously. It is the only way to really and honestly understand the impact your business has on the environment. Second, look beyond your company's walls and even well beyond its immediate business activities. Like it or not, we're all part of an ecosystem and you can exert real influence on it. Third, engage your suppliers and your customers. Expand your sphere of influence. Help them understand your values and by sharing your insight with them. They'll be better partners and stakeholders as a result. And finally, build your commitment to sustainability into your culture, your business goals, your operations, and your public presence. Sustainability is not an initiative or a project. It is a world view. Some people may ask, can a company afford to do this? The easy retort is to say, 
we can't afford not to do it. The cost savings and risk reduction for our business future is very clear. The more complicated answer is no less true. There are now lots of good research that shows that precisely the healthy companies that derive the most benefits from proactive sustainability efforts. It really is a virtual cycle that enhances your brand, your employees and your customers. Let me share some of our experiences. A couple of years ago, Levi Strauss and Company was fighting for our business survival. Sales were down around the world and we had to take a hard look at what we could do to better respond to our customer needs. We did extensive research with our consumers and we found that they loved the company and they loved our brands. But they just weren't happy with the product offerings at the time. They were rooting for us, wanted us to succeed, wanted to buy our products. The feedback was clear. They had this incredible loyalty to our brands because we'd spent more than 150 years leading with our values. They knew we were a company that would do the right thing, that was authentic and they trusted us. They just didn't like our products at the time. It was a very interesting insight. They said, love your company, support your company, but if your product's not relevant, we're not going to buy it. So you've got to get both of these things in tune. We went back, looked at our product, but I firmly believe today, without that consumer goodwill we'd built up, it would have been very difficult to get through that challenging period. We worked hard to turn around, so now we're market leaders again. But I believe our values played a key role in buying us that time and getting the consumer to come back and buy our products. I put emphasis on consistent and authentic values because I strongly believe that customers quickly sniff out companies who do things for the short-term PR or marketing. They know the difference and they reward it with their loyalty. So even when companies and consumers are cutting back, I'm not hesitant to say that there's a genuine and productive role here for well-known brands like ours to take the lead. We want to use our reputation and our history not just to sell products, but to shape the environment in which they're used and manufactured. When we do this right, a company is not just being a, corp a good corporate citizen, it's aspiring to change the world for the better. Levi's became famous because, as our motto said, we wanted to change the way people dress around the world. I don't see why a business looking far beyond its own boundaries can't aspire to change the way people around the world think. We want to be part of that transformation. It is one of the most energising activities we can do. As a business leader of the future, I hope you'll join us, challenge us, engage with us and help us do it better. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Thank you. We have some time for some questions, but I will have to ask you to come up to one of the microphones because we are getting this on video. Please, sir. Uh, thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you very much for your time. Um, I just have one question about uh, balancing your, comp your competitiveness with uh, also spreading a value that may be beneficial to everybody. It seems to me like CSR is something where the more companies are participating in it, the more value there is for the, the world as a whole but obviously that eats into your competitiveness with respect to other companies. What is your, your feeling about cooperation, not just with Adidas or with Ikea, but with brands that you may be more competitive with? And how do you balance the need to compete with the need to bring these values to the, the greater good? Ah, look, it's a great question. And um, you know, we struggled with this as well. But we came to the conclusion in the end we can't do it all by ourselves. That the more companies we engage in the dialogue, the more companies that support us, we can make a difference. So to us, this is an underlying platform of what we do. You've got to recognise in the end, as the example I gave you, there's doing the right thing and there's also having great products. So our point of view is two. We will share with our competitors, work with them to try to make a difference from a sustainability point of view. We will not share with them our product innovation. 
It fits together, I think. You talked about, uh, you know, obviously improving um, your footprint by having people uh, wash and dry less. Are you doing anything from a technological standpoint to um, make your clothes more stain resistant or dirt resistant? And if you're doing that through the use of nanoparticles, um, what, how is Levi and how is the apparel industry thinking about uh, the health risks over the long term from using those sort of new chemistries? Yeah, well, once again, it's, it's, it's an interesting balance, isn't it? Because jeans by nature are something you want to live in, you feel better. Most of you know the second or third day you wear your jeans, they feel better anyway. They shouldn't look too clean. Uh, we at one stage tried to waterproof the jeans. Then we said, what are we talking about? <laughs> jeans are something that should be lived in. Having said that, where we applied more of the functional benefits is in our Dockers products with this notion of wrinkle-free stain resistant. But it is a balance between getting the chemical use right. That's why we now have a, a list of um, chemicals that we don't use that do harm the environment. So I think there's lots of opportunities we get into the new nanotechnology that we can explore. Bottom line is, we will continue to focus on this. We will find ways that reduce the impact on the environment. But it's not stopping us playing in that area, because we're not going to ignore it. We bring a consumer benefit, and at the same time, that consumer benefit has got to leave a smaller footprint. Constantly working at it. But I can assure you, there's lots of things we've rejected, because either they don't enhance the environment, well, the chemical risk is just not worth doing. It would be easy to have stain-resistant, iron-resistant, flame-retardant, bulletproof product. <laughs> really easy. But from an environmental point of view, it would be absolutely the wrong thing to do. We look at that all the time. And that's one of the reasons. You know, we have this filter. And the filter we use on everything we do, and it starts with our designers. What is the impact on the environment, on the decisions you're making, as you design the future products. And then we have our technological group that is focusing on smarter ways to, to manufacture our product and um, how we bring it to market. Same filter applies. You've got to be really disciplined in this. Hi, thank you. Um, I have a question on um, some of the interaction that you might have with activist groups. Uh, a lot of times activist groups actually target those firms that are already being proactive about, about environmental and social issues. How would you characterize um, your interactions with them and do they influence you? To, to what extent do they or don't they? Well, yeah, first of all, we've learned that you know, the smart ways work with these NGO groups. There's really no one out there that wants to to destroy companies that are willing to do the right thing. So we've moved along this journey. We go out and we embrace. We talk to the NGOs. We share with what we're doing. You know, we ask them, how can we do a better job together? If we go to that place, you diffuse the whole discussion. And credit to my team. They, they really do embrace what's happening. So we encourage people. Someone out there probably has got a new idea. Someone out there probably can think about reinventing the discussion. So we don't ignore what's happening. Now, where people do come and try to attack us, and you're right. I mean, one of the dilemmas you face is that big brands will get the most publicity. Big brands and big companies usually are a, an easy way to make a point of view in the media. That's always going to be around. So talk to them. Work with them. Don't ignore them. Encourage them, but at the same point of view. You've got to be really honest about putting your own perspective on why you're doing the things and what's important to us. The dialogue, I think, is important. Encourage it. Don't ignore it. Thanks for the talk. I, I, I was wondering if you could help with us, uh, if you could share with us what's coming. Like, in what major projects are you planning to embark or what major changes do you foresee in the next five to ten years in addition to what you share with us in terms of cotton and product use? Right. Well, let's focus on that. I talked to you about the Better Cotton Initiative. You know, we envisage the day that cotton, the way it's growing, will dramatically change, that more and more of our products will be made up of Better Cotton Initiative. It's tiny today because you've got to be able to develop the confidence with the farmers to change their crops. I think we'll continue to come up with ways where less water can be used. 
we'll look at different ways of the solar energy, I think, how we apply that to the manufacturing process. All of these exciting initiatives ahead. I think it's embracing technology. Uh, that Dean and I were talking about when we came into here. You know, some of the work that you people are doing, working with the scientists, putting a commercial lens about if this is the new horizon, how can we apply that in a commercial way? It's a very exciting time because I think more and more companies are, opening to do, are open to do this. In the past, we sort of hoped all these things would go away, that it may fundamentally change the business model we got. You can't stay in that place. I think that, without giving you any more specifics, I've shared with you where our journey is going. We've only just started. We've really only just started. Uh, all I do know is we will continue to reevaluate what the opportunities are. We'll continue to stay committed to reduce our footprint and we'll try to work in much more environmentally friendly ways. Now, I'm generally excited about this because I think it's going to just reinvent the way that industries can dialogue with consumers and not apologise but work together and reinvent the whole business models. Very exciting. Uh, you mentioned that you're piloting a traceability program this year and at the same time you also outlined some of the real challenges being able to trace cotton. I was wondering if you could give us a few more details about that uh, program. Well, I think you know, the first thing is, as I shared with you, as we go through this life cycle, we've learnt it's not enough for us just to say we're only going to focus on the jeans or the pants. So as we now inform all our suppliers all the way up, it'll be traceability through cotton. It could be where water's coming from and how it's used. Um, even with the pesticide companies, and we've got to be frank, I mean, cotton still will use pesticides for the next decade or couple. We may be able to work with them on more efficient ways on how they can develop these type of products. It's totally an open agenda, but uh, it's, it's really interesting. The more we learn, the more we've got to focus ourselves on. We can't do it all. So I suspect we'll have to put our own filter on where can we make the biggest difference and where can we do that in the fastest possible time. Cotton is the first one. Um, who knows? Perhaps when we come back in 12 months' time, I can share future on what else we've learned. But early, early days as we gather all this information. Ah, a Levi's jean wearer. <laughs> Very yes, happy with this. Well, thanks for your talk. I have a question regarding your consumer interaction you talked about. So as an economist, it seems to me that all of these strategies you outlined, um, washing your jeans less, less often, washing with cold water, line drying, donating to Goodwill, will have an effect on the demand for jeans. So it sounds like it's going to decrease demand for the new jeans, so people would buy less jeans. So I'm wondering how are you making up for that? Are you, like, what are your strategies? As you say, it's, it's profits at the same time. As yeah, it is an interesting dilemma, isn't it? I mean, and this is why we've got to balance. The reality is, and this is why we use this notion of, of profitability, you know, company have got to survive to be able to contribute back into the the societies in which they operate. And I'll be very clear with you, I want this to be a bigger, stronger company. I want to be able to sell more jeans. I want to be able to sell more pants because that will give me the capability to do the type of things we're talking about. Now, I want to do it better than anyone else. And if the total category doesn't grow and I put more people out of business that aren't compared to operate in this point of view, that may be the outcome. But I suspect that won't be. I mean, consumers are always looking for something new. Innovation can come from many different places. I think we've just got to feel good about the products we wear. And perhaps the apparel industry can play a leading role in that. Perhaps the apparel industry will be able to reinvent how companies expand the category in a way that does less damage to the environment. But we do talk about that. It's, it's, a, it's you know, that nice balance, isn't it? Haven't got the full answers, but yeah, I was challenged the other day. Well, then. John, what, if you don't want to do all these things, what happens to the whole market? Well, no, we've got to be strong. We've got to grow because we are willing to contribute. And I hope consumers will respond. And, as I said, if I dominate the marketplace through doing that because I've got the best products with the best company that operates in a, the best manner, I'm fine with that. Not apologising for success. I think we have time for one more question. Hi, 
Hi. Um, I was actually interested in hearing a, a more personal take from you. Um, we talk a lot here, especially within the context of the Center for Responsible Business, about responsible business leadership. And, and given that you've been at the helm at this company for quite a while now, um, can you share with us a responsible leadership story, you know, a time when you had a dilemma or, you know, when you look back on your career, some, some, some time when, when you really will say, you know, I did the right thing and, and here's how I did it. I think it would be interesting for our students to hear, especially as they go out into the real world and uh, start leading their own companies and, you know, doing their own thing. Well, let, let, me, let me answer that in a slightly different way. Yeah, the challenge I think I put to you, all of you in this audience, what's important to you? What's really important to you? If you're clear on what your values are, that should play a role in what companies you want to work at. You've got to start from there. Companies like the company I work with, we've been very clear on what we stand with. I have no doubt I would not be at this company today if it didn't really in line with my own values and what was important to me. If you get then every day, it's not so much a test, it's just reinforcing what you believe in. We spend a lot of time interviewing people that come into this company. I get it that someone that's got an MBA is a bright person. I get it that someone's got an MBA has worked hard, but I really want to know what's important to you. Because for some of you, my company may not be the place you want to work. We're not going to be a company that does profit with our principles. That's not who we are. We have our key values. We have our environmental policy. We even have a brand value proposition for our employees. That's what makes us who we are. I'm not saying every company should be like that, but after 150 years, something works. And the commitment to that is non-negotiable from me and it's non-negotiable from my team. And very fortunately, the stakeholders and the shareholders in this company are aligned with that as well. From top to bottom, it's non-negotiable. So this notion of profit with principles. So I could share many stories, but the real story, I think, is all of you have to make decisions. You really do. Where do you want to work? What's important to you? And do you have the courage to stay committed to that journey? I have talked people out of joining Levi Strauss and Company. I said, if you want to come in here and be ruthless, slash and burn, and only drive profit to the bottom line, this isn't a place for you to be. This isn't a place for you to be. But if you truly want to come in and align to the values and drive sustainable, profitable growth, then this is an option for you. So we have our filters. But in the end of the day, they're not difficult because they're there, we're disciplined, and we obey them. And where we were tested is that story I shared with you earlier on, when things got really tough. We didn't back off our contributions. We stayed true. But we sure were tested. We certainly were tested. That's what leadership's all about. It really is. Now more so than ever. Where do you want to work? Where do you want to go to school? Consistent and authentic values is something we are taking more and more of a stand on. So this is music, to, hear that. music to my ears. Uh, I won't advertise ours right now, but uh, uh, what, what leaders really do is often described as three things. They set direction, they build alignment around that direction and vision, and they motivate people to fulfill on that direction. John Anderson is a leader. Thank you, sir, for being here today. Thank you Thank very you. much.